On this week's Garnet Research Roundup, I'm delighted to be joined by Enrique lopez Hueth from Royal Holloway University of London. I'm going to be talking about a, a paper in plant physiology that he's put together in collaboration with workers in Hungary and also in Germany, uh, principally um, with Frank Tittengu from Klaus Palmer's lab in Freiburg. And the title of the paper is Converging Light, Energy and Hormonal Signaling, Control Meristem Activity, Leaf Initiation and Growth. Okay, so thanks very much, Enrique, for joining us today. And, you know, there's a lot of information in this, uh, in this paper, 12 figures in all. It covers a lot of in- interactions between these, these different signaling pathways. But if possible, it would be great if you could give us just a general overview of what you find within the paper. Um, um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll have a go. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the paper addresses first a question we try to tackle um, already 10 years ago, <laughs> the question is very simple. Uh, why do plants not make leaves in the dark mm-hmm. and make leaves in the light? And the, the, the reason to ask the question is, is pretty obvious. You know, uh, uh, this is as fundamental a change as you can get. The meristem is inactive or active. Yeah. So if we could understand how is meristem- meristematic activity controlled by the plant itself, mm-hmm. uh, maybe one day we could do something about about uh, tweaking it and, and about telling the plant, do this, do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, years ago, we, uh, in, in, in work, I was very fortunate, I'm very fortunate to have a colleague at Royal Holloway, uh, Laszlo Bogre, mm-hmm. who's a, a plant growth biologist. Uh, Some time ago, we tried to tackle this by, by uh, doing what is apparently very straightforward, but no one had tried, uh, do this global uh, gene expression analysis, Mm -hmm. focusing just on this problem. What happens as a seedling with an arrested meristem first sees light, Mm -hmm. specifically at the meristem, not elsewhere, specifically Mm -hmm. at the meristem? Well, we couldn't uh, do this specifically at the meristem. We tried as close as we could get, dissecting shoot apices. It's a lot of a lot of shoot apices. A lot of shoot apices, more than we later realized, more than we needed, because our very first sample, after many trials of uh, methods, it, uh, contained dissected, etiolated Arabidopsis sh- uh, shoot apices from 3,000 seedlings. Wow. Mm-hmm. And uh, we obtained 200 micrograms of RNA, okay. which turned out to be 10 times what we needed. <laughs> So we could have uh, dissected wow. a few less. Okay. <laughs> That's fairer, at least. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so, uh, and we did a time course. No. Mm-hmm. It was unbelievably uh, informative. We, we came up with some uh, models of not just what was the growth that was happening, but how was it being controlled. Mm-hmm. Okay. And the mechanism that we could see, uh, there was more than one. There was a direct light control of... of uh, cell cycle controlling transcription factors Mm -hmm. and there was a light control of hormonal responses. We look for uh, gene expression changes that we could use as signatures of hormonal responses. Uh, And we found a a, a light control of a a switch between a a high oxygen state, oxygen signaling state that was apparently incompatible with growth to a transient low cytokine, uh, low oxygen state, which coincided with a high cytokine signaling state. Okay. And there were other things that we could not make sense of, including uh, a, a rapid, very rapid shutdown within an hour, specifically the shoot apex, of a bunch of genes that we had no idea what they were doing. After, after sometime after that paper, we realized that this group, this odd group of genes, we couldn't make sense of. Mm-hmm was packed full of what we call, what other people had called rather, uh, starvation genes. Okay. okay. And we came to the conclusion that the shoot apis in the dark was undergoing a state of starvation. Okay. Uh, and this was just the shoot apis. Uh, the hypocotyl, uh, the cotyledons were not showing the signature. In fact, the hypocotyl was growing exceptionally long in the dark. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. In, in an attempt, quote unquote, to reach the soil surface. Yeah. You know, that's the, the, the fitness value of the, mm-hmm. of the response. <clears throat> so, 
In this paper, we try to track those two issues. What happened with the hormonal mechanism? And what is this starvation response? Okay. And our conclusion is that the, the hormonal control mechanism uh, seems to happen. It's mm -hmm. true, it's correct, uh, by dissecting many stems again. Uh, but uh, in, a, in, a, in a new uh, approach in which we arrest the, the meristem after leaves have initiated, arrested by putting it in the dark and bringing it back into the light, and we see very similar responses to the ones we, see, we saw when we first put uh, fully deolated cereals in the, in the light. Mm -hmm. uh, the very same responses we see again uh, uh, an increase in auxin responses uh, uh, in the dark, uh, which uh, coincides with the arrest of growth, and uh, a, a rush of starvation responses. Okay. It so, transfer to light, and the cell cycle comes back on, uh, the starvation responses disappear very rapidly, and the, the auxin responses suffer a transient drop, and the cytokine responses come back. Okay. Uh, with them we see uh, various other growth activities uh, in addition to the cell cycle, every stage, uh, obviously happening simultaneously in separate cells, uh, uh, we see a lot of translation activity, ribosomal genes, ribosomal protein genes, mm -hmm. these sorts of things. Okay. okay, so let me come in there. So you've given a nice overview of um, you know, all the work in the paper, and you've mentioned a lot of things, hormone responses, the energy response, um, looking at the cell cycle, and you've got experiments of, all, of that nature to test all those different things throughout the paper. So one thing I did find very interesting, which maybe you can touch on, the light signal and the sucrose signal are uh, uh, making more leaf development, but in a slightly different way. So can you touch a little on that? Yeah, yeah. So um, this is, is something we, we do not fully understand, but yeah. it, at the moment it looks to us like light is using a double control mechanism. Okay. Uh, the, the hormone uh, status, homeostasis related one, uh, initiated partly through 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 uh, oxygen transport responses through the control of uh, membrane localization of pin, mm -hmm. of pin one, and the starvation or uh, energy avail availability uh, control mechanism. Mm -hmm. Why those two? Uh, do they do the same thing? Is one a consequence of the other? Uh, or are they both necessary? So we know we can switch on uh, meristematic activity just with sucrose in the dark. Okay. We know we can switch on meristematic activity uh, just playing with the hormonal status in the dark. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we use uh, an oxygenal limitation, we supply cytokine, and we get leaves initiated. But the result of those two operations, those two interventions, is different. The hormonal status activates the meristem and you you begin to see reasonably normal leaves initiate. Mm -hmm. When you just turn on energy signaling, you do not see such a thing. What you get is the, the beginnings of leaf initiation, but the meristem becomes particularly active as a, as a rib meristem. Okay. It, it activates the production of internals, and mm -hmm. although leaves initiate, most of what is produced is very large petioles mm -hmm. and very little leaf lamina. Okay, interesting. So uh, we think uh, both, we still don't fully inter uh, understand the interaction, but both of those interventions control meristematic activity, but to have normal leaf development uh, is dependent on a light-like hormonal status. Okay, cool. Unless you have that, you have this hugely shade-avoiding-like seedlings, okay. which can even flower, but but uh, produce mostly internodes, mostly petioles, mm -hmm. and uh, hardly anything else. Until, this is curious to me, uh, until you, you reach the flowering stage, the flowers then become relatively normal. So mm. it looks like the meristematic activity is hugely under hormonal uh, control, dependent on light, until the transition to flowering happens. Okay. Uh, once the transition to flowering happens, uh, the developmental program is pretty much set. Light, dark, nothing seems to matter. Okay. There's a huge amount of environmental dependence prior to the transition to flowering. 
after the transition of flowering, there's a huge amount of regulation of homeostasis mm-hmm. of set organ development. Okay, well, that's great. So you've given us a real nice overview. And as I said, there's a, there's a lot of information in this paper. So encourage readers and listeners to, to go and have a look at it and, and you know, look at the, the, the more of the detail of, that you've put into the paper. So, Enrique, thank you very much for joining us today. And, uh, you know, you've just brought up a lot of interesting differences. And no doubt that in the future we'll see, uh, see more work in this area from, uh, from you and your lab as well. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ian.